Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak, and I am going to change things just a little bit. Um, I run a program at the National Institute called iGene, which the long drawn out name is the National Ophthalmic Genotyping and Phenotyping Network. And just a little bit about me really quickly. Um, I came to the NEI in 2008. Um, I have a background in genetics, um, basic research in the um, in rare eye conditions in both DNA and protein labs. And I actually have a daughter with um, oculocutaneous albinism. So I was really interested when I was offered the job at NEI because I have a real passion for, um, for the job I was presented to run. And the job really is about um, collaborative medicine, creating a bridge that links clinicians, researchers, and patients to bring new medicines and innovation um, to our knowledge of inherited eye conditions. Um, so you'll recall, everybody has heard about the successful gene therapy trial, trials that began in canines um, by Gus Aguari's lab and Gene Bennett. And from there, they moved into doing some gene therapy trials for, um, act for human patients with LCA, Leber congenital amaurosis, particularly the RP65 gene. Um, they've had several papers from that, and the, um, the field has really grown recently into even expanding into other gene therapy targets. Um, so again, RP65, uh, and then all the other ones listed, Usher's, um, Lieber Hereditary Optic Neuropathy, Stargardt, all of those trials are either underway or um, on the horizon. So again, we wanted to figure out, as, um, the, as the National Institutes of Health, the National Eye Institute, how can we help to accelerate this process from bench to clinic? How can we um, promise uh, to, to get these rare populations, specifically um, subsets of people with genetic conditions, specific mutation types even, um, to a place where they the researchers have access to them and can help them study um, their phenotype, their genotype, and develop treatments. So originally, in 2004, the Advisory Eye Council met to, and, um, at the NEI and decided that they were going to create this network, later to become known as iGene. They wanted to create a disease information and genetic testing referral resource in 2004, there were very few um, CLIA-certified um, molecular testing labs for most of the inherited eye conditions that people were considering as targets for gene therapy trials. We also wanted to contain, or the project to contain a patient, patient registry so that later on these patients could be enrolled in the treatment trials that they were helping to um, provide knowledge for. They wanted to collect data in a de-identified way so the vision research community could use that information, and also to collect DNA specimens from all of the people that we were gathering data on. So they created the iGene network, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about the details of it and how it works. Um, so again, we've created this network partnership um, with the federal government, CLIA-certified labs, private academic centers, patients, researchers, um, private industry throughout the U.S. and Canada, and we're in the process of expanding this now to other countries as well. We've created a centralized place where patients can get diagnostic genotyping, and that information can then be available for researchers to access. Um, for each of the people that we enroll and do phenotype-genotype correlation, that those samples are available for researchers to access, along with all the data collected that corresponds to them. And we really want to have a, a, a voice in the community as well to increase public and professional awareness of the value of diagnostic testing and what an accurate diagnosis can do in the clinic to provide a patient with a, an, a realistic anticipation of what their progression might be and what treatments or innovations may be on the horizon for them. So the iGene organization, we have three parts. Again, we have the patient repository, 
Um, so this is, I'll show you again in, in a slide in a couple minutes, but there's a repository, a registry, and then the actual online database. Referring clinicians and eligible patients interact with this big white bubble, which is the iGene Coordinating Center, and that's in the clinical center at the National Institutes of Health. Vision researchers can also foray with this, um, this network, and then we have network CLIA laboratories throughout the U.S. These are certified CLIA laboratories that often offer fee-for-service um, tests that also collaborate with us to provide patients through our program. This is a web-based program, so you know, patients do not have to come to the NIH. They can be seen at uh, ophthalmologists or healthcare provider sites, genetic counseling sites throughout the U.S. and Canada. The program is divided into two stages for logistical reasons. The first stage started first, it makes sense. In 2006, we recruit our first patient. So stage one of iGene is just about the patient accrual and how that process works, including the consent forms that patients sign, um, the logistics of running our own DNA extraction and banking laboratory. And then the stage two part came a little bit later, and this is how researchers can access then the data and samples that we've collected, as well as the patient registry. Both of the stages are under um, the NIH IRB approval protocols. Okay, so just talk a little bit about stage one. Again, we can recruit patients from private clinical practices, academic centers, and we do collect samples as well from the NIH Clinical Center, specifically the National Eye Institute. About 25% of our patients are enrolled through the NEI. <clears throat> patients have to be enrolled by a certified um, healthcare provider or genetics professional. Um, and this can be anyone that has access to the eye healthcare information. Um, a lot of times we even have neurologists or um, every once in a while pediatricians who will enroll their patients as long as they can get us the phenotype um, details, the clinical details of the eye exam, then um, that's an acceptable way to enroll. The clinicians have to enter their patient's di uh, family history and diagnostic information on our database, So, and that is specifically clinical information that would come from a traditional um, eye exam for whatever the uh, presenting diagnosis is. And then there's consent forms that they must sign um, and a blood sample that we require. All right, so our system includes the repository of DNA and blood samples. We have DNA and blood for every participant that's enrolled in the program. That is a um, eligibility requirement. We also store their contact information, which is just accessible to the clinician who's doing the referring and the iGene Coordinating Center, which has six people at the moment who can access that, so it's held very confidentially. Um, we also have the Phenotypic and genotypic information, so the phenotypic information I'll show you in a minute is basically survey questions based on the diagnosis, and the genotype if we have it. So if we're able to send the sample out for CLIA diagnostic testing, we'll collect that information as well. And the researchers can then access all of this except for the um, patient's contact information and consent forms. The patient has to agree in the consent to have their sample stored indefinitely in our biorepository and to be used for future research. Now the patient does have a couple choices. They can elect to not receive their re results, their CLIA uh, certified test results. And this sometimes happens because of uh, different beliefs that people have um, about their genetic testing, which is absolutely fine. Um, and we also allow them to opt out of being recontacted so they can opt out of the registry portion. The database captures, in addition to just data elements, we also collect photos, um, OCTs, different types of, um, of files, anything that would relate to the diagnosis that the patient has, we would collect that, visual fields. We have um, a whole lot of files. <laughs> and then again, the genetic testing is entered in the database too, so you can make those connections between um, 
as Dr. Michael Dean was saying this morning, between Stargardt and AMD, and you can compare ABCA4 mutations. So just quickly onto the research aspect. Um, so this is a screenshot of what a researcher will see. So they don't see any information about um, patients' um, private health information. So everything is coded with a random ID generated by the database, and then the diagnoses are listed. And if you click on those links, you actually see clinical information about each of the subjects. You can use this ID to request samples from our uh, biobank, and you also have access to the genetic test results and any files that we have corresponding. And those are all curated by our coordinating center to make sure there's no um, identifiable information as much as, as possible. The, ac uh, the access to the research application is through a summary review um, by our review committee. They meet quarterly. Um, there are some scientists on our steering committee that look over the proposal just to make sure that the, what the researcher is presenting is one, something that we are capable of addressing with the data that we've collected, and two, that it conforms to the consent forms that the patients have signed and agreed to. Once approval is granted, um, they work with primarily me uh, to identify samples and I'll provide them access and short training to use the system. And I can also contact potential study participants, um, and I'll show you some examples of that. We do, as the NIH, try to be the best citizens of American taxpayer money as possible, so we, uh, we encourage all of our users to share their data openly, and part of that is through um, allowing us to post information about their studies on our website, as well as present them here at meetings. <clears throat> so, so far, and I'm sorry I didn't update this, I just have a couple more approved studies over the past couple days, but we have 12 approved studies now. And we've had studies that are just looking at um, genotype-phenotype correlations in ABCA4, such as uh, Dr. Dean presented earlier. We also have <clears throat> a couple studies who are generating iPS cells from specific allele mutations in the best one gene. Um, so, for instance, for this study, it's being taken on at Columbia. Um, the researcher wanted just individuals with these allelic changes. Um, we had 40 patients at the time with best one diagnosis and uh, molecular characterization, and out of those 40, two fit this criteria. So it was, it was really exciting for me because even though two is not a large N, um, at Columbia, they had identified none. So being able to provide two and being able for the researcher to test a potential compound in a dish um, was pretty pretty big deal, and you never know where that will go in the future. That study would not have gotten off the ground had it not been for something like um, the iGene program. <clears throat> We've also had um, several studies now that are looking at screening large panels of genes, so not whole exome, but custom capture panels, where they take all of the genes associated with um, retina and corneal um, disorders and test them all at one time. And this has been very, um, very interesting for us because the results are way more productive than just piecemeal CLIA testing where you send for one gene or a panel, a small panel of genes. Um, the only trick is that sometimes the results don't make complete sense if you're considering uh, that these are Mendelian disorders. There are often a lot of genes that are interacting, and sometimes you really don't know exactly what to make of it. So that's a research story that I think will continue for years to come. <clears throat> We've had um, people just looking at the genetics of choriduremia just to look at summary data and um, all sorts of interesting things with Stargardt disease, again, as Dr. Dean presented, just the, um, the implications with Stargardt disease, even though it's generally considered to be a recessive Mendelian condition where you would have two mutations on two separate alleles, often we do not find those two mutations. So there's a lot of interest in what else could be going on with those patients. Uh, some of the benefits for patients, clearly they get 
clinical diagnost diagnostic genotyping. We do not charge the patients for this. Um, we can't cover the cost of a blood draw or any of the subsequent um, appointments they have with the doctor or a genetic counselor for, um, for pre and post counseling. Uh, but we do not send them a bill for the diagnostic testing. We take care of that through our contracts. Um, it really is a benefit for the patients to have the program housed at the NEI because there is long-term uh, support for this. A lot of times, individual investigators will collect lots of samples and do their own research through the years, but when they retire, there's no plan for those samples or data. So this is a long-term plan that the NEI has come up with. For physicians, it gives you easy access to um, to, to get genetic testing for your patients. It does require that you enter information about your patient, and sometimes that can be time consuming. Um, the web-based system is sometimes uh, hard to deal with, but at least you don't have to deal with trying to um, fight with insurance companies to get coverage for these tests for your patients. And it's all web-based, so you can access it anywhere. All your patient's data is stored in one centralized location. You can go back to it any time instead of pulling out a file. And then for researchers and clinical investigators, I think the results are, are pretty clear here. Um, we're leading an effort for standardizing clin clinical phenotypic descriptors. We have this database that people can access, um, and you can actually identify pools of patients for future trials. And it's also free. So, um, Some of the metrics that we have, just real quick, uh, we've had steady growth. We're actually over 5,000 samples now. We test over 100 genes just from the clinical side, not even considering the research uses. Uh, we test for over 35 diseases. And this isn't meant to be legible from a distance, but you can go to our website and see the list of things that we do accept um, into the iGene program. There's anything from Usher syndrome to um, hermansky pudlock syndrome. Um, some of the neurodegeneration with brain iron accumulation, some very rare conditions that we accept. Um, we, these are what we have fairly to date. We have over 1,000 RP, almost 2,000 RP samples, so retinitis pigmentosa, and that actually includes some other random, very rare things. <laughs> it's called retinitis pigmentosa and other uh, degenerations, so it's kind of a hodgepodge. But um, Stargardt disease, we probably have over 1,500 patients with Stargardt disease at this point. Conrad dystrophy, those are the three of our most um, highly enrolled categories. We have over 350 clinical organizations that participate, and we have about, uh, at any time, between 8 and 12 CLIA partners that we work with. Um, we have several sites that have gone through their own IRB approval, and I haven't really gotten into this too much, but um, we do have a, a mechanism for the IRB approval process. We've had over 70 publications, uh, we facilitate research, and we're a model for other biorepositories. We've spoken to um, Genetic Alliance and other organizations about how to be a model for that. Um, through our research, we've identified several new genes novel mutations, new variants. Um, almost 70% now of our par participants have received genetic results, whether that was us confirming research results or just straight genetic testing from um, the CLIA labs. And we have more than 30 patients who are actually enrolled in other clinical trials because of iGene. I'm not gonna go through all those. Um, we facilitate research, um, deliver diagnostics, generally just facilitate collaboration between the clinicians, the patients, and the researchers so that everyone can get to those next steps in what um, clinical diagnosis and developing new technologies and treatments is going to be. Um, some things that we're moving toward are developing different um, biobank management and curation methodologies to share with the community. Um, it's not an easy task to develop a biorepository and keep it functional, and um, one of the things that people in the biorepository field say are that you're going to be funding freezer farms, the three Fs, 
So a lot of institutions want to create biorepositories, but might not necessarily take the necessary actions to make it safe and secure. And um, I can tell you last night, I got a call at 2 a.m. about a freezer failure. <laughs> so you have to have contingency plans. Oh, uh, okay, thank you. Um, and then we have the web-based access. Um, the next steps, again, international expansion. Right now, we're working specifically with Italy. Um, and then we're, we're trying to bridge the gap to Japan um, and some other countries. Uh, we're developing standardized phenotypic descriptors with the National Laboratory of Medicine. We're working um, with Clem McDonald, who is kind of the godfather of LOINC codes to develop more ophthalmology LOINC um, coding. And then we're also sharing our variant data that we get from all the clinical and research data on a Leiden open variant database. And you can see that basically just lists all of the variants we ever find so that researchers, clinicians can look at that and see if it's been located before. I often get calls or emails from people asking about specific mutations and whether or not we've seen those in affected individuals so they can help to inform their decision of um, what to tell the patient for genetic counseling. And the Leiden Open Variant Database has some really cool things where it just um, gives you stats of all the variants, which being in genetics, I think, is really neat. But um, this is our working group. Again, we're very small. Uh, we're very um, passionate about what we do. All of us work all the time on this project and just put our heart and soul into it. So we're happy to see that um, that real research outcomes are coming from it. And with that, I'll just say thank you and uh, open it up for questions. Any question? Okay. I think you answered this already, but just in terms of if I wanted to look up to see how many samples we had of a particular corneal dystrophy, mm -hmm. what would be the what would be the website, the the one stop that I could just find that? So you can go I'm gonna pull up our website. Um, it's nei.nih.gov slash IG. And um, because we are small, we develop all the content for our website. So I can admit that I do that. And um, it's not necessarily up to date. But if you email me directly, I could give you the exact number at that time. And, and your email? Oh, it's gets, G-O-E-T-Z. It's K actually in the program. Oh, so okay. all yeah. speaker okay. emails are in Great. the program. Great, thank you. Perfect. Carrie, one more question. Sure. Um, what's preventing you from expanding internationally? So what do you need at the end user, so-called? We have had, for years, discussions with different countries um, about expanding the process or the program. Um, a lot of countries, it depends on their needs. We've had a lot of countries who don't have access to diagnostic clinical tests, and we really can't provide that. We don't have the funds and... Um, you mean like OCT visual fields, those? Those things and the diagnostics, so okay. like testing for ABCA4 okay. outside of the United States. We use taxpayer money okay. to pay for that yeah. test, so it'd be, it'd, it'd be a little tricky to pay other countries. But what we're looking at now and with Italy, um, we have a group that has their own biorepository. They, um, they are collecting their own samples and banking their own samples and have their own testing methods. So at this point, we want to share data. Um, it's MAGI, okay. um, Dr. Falsini uh, Benedetto. Benedetto. Yeah, Benedetto. Um, so, so they have their own program. What we want to do now is just expand data sharing, be able to collaborate um, and, and give researchers access to all of that. You will share the sample in the lab? Uh, in a it depends. There are different um, policies internationally. So some countries you can't ship DNA back and forth. Um, but we could at least share data. Uh, we could share clinical phenotype. So. Oh, excuse me. Right. Um, so for for researchers or um, for researchers, we do ask that you provide that you've had an IRB look at the process. Sometimes they exempt the study. Um, if it's all de-identified, that's mostly what happens. If you're, not, if you're a researcher and you want to look at the data and get the samples and you're not ever seeing any patients or their information, then those are exempted. But we do require that 
your institutional IRB has looked at it. And if you're not from an institution, um, there are some commercial IRBs that are available to do that for you. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Sure. We're oh. just a little behind on time, so if you can ask, approach Carrie at the end, sorry. Okay. Right. okay.